And our next lecturer will be Dr. Kubo Machak, who is the legal advisor in the ICRC's legal division, uh, assigned jointly to the thematic unit uh, and the commentaries unit. Prior to joining the ICRC in October 2019, he worked as an associate professor at the University of Exeter. In that position, Kupa taught and researched in the areas of public international law, international humanitarian law, and international cyber law. He's the author of the book, Internationalized Armed Conflicts in International Law, and uh, author of multiple articles. Kubo is also the general editor of the Cyber Law Toolkit, uh, which is an interactive online resource on the international law of cyber operations. He holds a doctorate in international law from the University of Oxford and undergraduate degree from the University of Prague. So, Kubo, the floor is yours, and you will cover the uh, international humanitarian law, as I understand. Please. Uh, thank you, Heli. That's absolutely right. Uh, I will talk about international humanitarian law in cyberspace. So greetings to everyone who is joining us today. Greetings from a sunny Geneva. It's, as you can see, it's a very warm day in Geneva today, so I apologize for not uh, wearing a jacket. And uh, I would say that, uh, you know, the current situation that we see around us in the world obviously has many poses many disadvantages, poses many obstacles, but we have also seen a lot of innovation. And I think today's event is one such example of uh, having a really, truly inclusive conversation. And on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross, it is a true privilege and honor to join this, uh, uh, the ranks of uh, my previous speakers and those who will follow. So, as many of our viewers will know, the mandate of the organization that I represent is to act as the guardian and promoter of international humanitarian law. So, obviously, the application of international humanitarian law in all contexts is a very important issue to us. And thus, we are very grateful to the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the invitation. And we're also grateful to our listeners and viewers for tuning in. So without further ado, let me start with the presentation. So perhaps the good way, a good way of starting it would be to look at the, uh, the definition of the terms that we're going to use. So IHL is sometimes referred to also as LOAC, in other words, the law of armed conflict, or in Latin as used in bello. It is very important to say that when we talk about international humanitarian law, we are not talking about the use ad bellum, but uh, luckily we had uh, uh, Catherine's lecture, which has uh, explained the basic concepts of the use ad bellum. So let me just very quickly reiterate, perhaps for, for those viewers, viewers who are just joining now. When we talk about the use ad bellum, we use the vocabulary of just war, unjust war. We use the vocabulary of aggressors and aggressor state and victim states. And the key sources here are the United Nations Charter and customary international law. So in other words, use ad bellum tells us when is it permissible for states to use force in their international relations. Now, use in bello, which will be the focus of my lecture, on the other hand, is a little bit more technical, uses little less loaded terms to describe what it is about. So it speaks about a situation of an armed conflict. It talks about belligerent parties. And the key sources for uh, IHL are the Geneva Conventions, additional protocols, and again, the customary international humanitarian law. So this difference between the two is uh, in that IHL tells us what are the rules that apply when there is already an ongoing situation of an armed conflict. And so we need to, to, to maintain a strict separation between these two concepts. And I'm going to focus on the latter in the, remainder, in the remainder of my talk. Now, what do we talk about when we mention cyber operations during armed conflicts? So the ICRC definition is that this notion of cyber operations refers to those operations that are led either against a computer, against a network, or a computer system, any other connected device, when such operations are used as methods and means of warfare in the context of an armed conflict. So we have to keep all of those aspects in mind. We are in a situation of an armed conflict, and then there are some operations that are using this modern technology as means and methods of warfare. That's when we talk about the older term is cyber warfare, but we prefer cyber operations during armed conflict. Now, the ICRC approach in this regard is threefold. You could say it's one, technology-oriented, 
right? So we focus on the developments of the technology and we try to understand how that is uh, evolving. Number two, it is human centric. So in other words, we are concerned about what is the potential human cost of cyber operations. And then number three, because we are lawyers in the legal division at the ICRC, it is focused on the law as well. And so in other words, we work in line with our mandate, which is to be the guardian and promoter of IHL. We work with respect to clarification and development of this body of law. So with definitions out of the way, what I'm going to talk about in the remainder of the talk are three big questions. Okay, when we say big, then different ways. So uh, the first one, the threshold question, asks whether IHL applies to cyber operation. I would put it to you that this is perhaps a question that has vexed states to some extent, but it is perhaps slightly easier to answer, as hopefully we will see, than the other two, which by contrast are big in the sense that they are controversial, they are difficult and complex questions, which do not yet have resolved, fully resolved answers. And so those are number two, the weapons questions. So I'm going to talk about one specific IHL obligation, and that is the weapons review obligation. And I'm going to look at how it applies to cyber capabilities. And then finally, I'll talk about the data question, which is about how IHL rules on targeting apply to cyber operations against data. So let's start with the first one. Let's start with the threshold question. Uh, or maybe even before we start with the threshold question, allow me to still say a little, a few words about the selection of these topics. So the first one, the threshold question, is uh, we need to choose it. It's an, it's an obvious choice because it tells us uh, without answering the threshold question, without knowing that IHL applies to cyber, operation, uh, to cyber operations, we cannot proceed to other questions how specifically it applies. So in, in, that's why it's a threshold question. It's a baseline question which we need to get out of the way first. Otherwise, everything else uh, remains irrelevant. Relevant. But about the two remaining ones, we draw exactly on the Cyber Law Toolkit project, which is the project that Heli kindly mentioned in the beginning. And in the context of this project, uh, the ICRC and four additional partners that include academic deemed into other international organizations uh, and, uh, and, national, uh, cyber and one national cybersecurity agency, we have got together a group of experts, government and military uh, legal practitioners and cyber operators, and we ask them what are the current issues, what are the current problems that they are facing when it comes to peacetime situations, such as those that Catherine has just spoken about, but also when it comes to situations of armed conflict. And it was precisely in the context of this project of this project that two such issues were clearly identified by the experts and those are the so-called weapons and the data question. So it's not just an arbitrary choice on our part, but it's something that came from this iterative discussion of experts in the context of our project. So now with uh, the justification out of the way, let's, tr let's now truly start with the first one, with the threshold question. So in other words, here we're asking, does IHL apply at all to cyber operations? Now, we have heard this several times today, cyberspace is not, as uh, one uh, older quote would suggest, the wild, wild west. States have many times affirmed that international law applies to cyberspace, uh, and in particular, of course, the Charter of the United Nations, which represents the use ad bellum body that uh, we have mentioned in the beginning. And so this has now become a, a part of this repeated consensus of states. In 2013, it was expressed by the UN Group of Governmental Experts experts, but that uh, statement has later been endorsed by a unanimous resolution of the UN General Assembly. And uh, if we fast forward, these are just two examples, let's say, from the start and from the beginning, or from the start of the process and just the most recent one that I could find. So that's the pre-draft of the UN open-ended working group uses almost the same language. Existing obligations under international law applicable to state use of ICTs, which is the code language for uh, operations in cyber space. So, but the question remains, does that also apply to international humanitarian law? In other words, we say that international law applies, but does that apply to all of its uh, constituent bodies? Now, the easy answer would be, you might be thinking, well, if we started out by saying that IHL is a part of international law, 
then if international law as a whole applies, then surely all of its constituent parts must apply as well. So as we lawyers like to say, a maiori ad minus, if the greater applies, then the smaller should apply as well. But it turns out, as also my uh, predecessors have mentioned, that this is a question that has generated some controversy among the states. So let's have a look at what happened and why this has generated such controversy. So, in other words, it's useful to revisit again the, the timeline of these UN-based processes with the UNGGE, where in the 2013 report we have seen a state consensus that international law in general applies in cyberspace. And then in 2015, a very important reference to principles of proportionality, distinction, necessity. And so these are principles that we recognize as principles of IHL. So it is an IHL language, which to many of us, at that time I was an academic, so speaking now uh, as, as a former academic, to many of us observers of these processes, it seemed to indicate that states are headed towards a clear acknowledgement that IHL is applicable in cyberspace as well. But then that process came to a halt in 2017. And of course, as we have heard, now we have two new processes. I have referred to the, the outputs of both of them, and we will hear uh, uh, certainly much more about them uh, in the remainder of today as well. But if we zoom in on the 2017 point, the point at which states failed to reach, an, uh, reach a consensus, it's interesting to analyze what were the reasons for that? What were the fault lines? And so reportedly, the reasons for the breakdown of consensus included several of the topics that we have talked about today. So number one, the issue of countermeasures, when states are allowed to respond to internationally wrongful acts under international law. Secondly, the right to save self-defense, so again, a part of the use ad bellum. But very importantly, for the purposes of this section of today, international humanitarian law. And then if we are to believe, because of course these discussions were uh, held behind closed doors, but if we are to, to believe the, the, the reasons that were uh, alluded to at the time, the key objections against the inclusion of IHL into the 2017 report that never came out were threefold. Number one, the absence of state practice. Number two, an argument that we need new rules. And number three, the argument about militarization of cyberspace. Now, the, the first of the three, the argument with the absence of state practice, if it ever was true, it probably is the time to, to put it to rest. We, according to various studies, we see around 100 states around the world developing military cyber capabilities. There are several states that have openly acknowledged having used such military cyber capabilities in time of armed conflict. So it is certainly not just science fiction that cyber operations can take place during armed conflicts. Then secondly, the argument that, oh, maybe we have this body of IHL, but actually cyber is so new that we need a new body of rules. Well, this is an interesting argument. It didn't stop states in the other areas of international law. And so it doesn't carry that much valence also in the area of IHL. Surely there might be some rules that are new, that are needed in, in the present time, but we have to start by acknowledging that there is already an existing body of law and see how that body of law applies to existing situations. So perhaps the most convincing and the most worrying of the three arguments is the argument from militarization of cyberspace. And to, to give it justice, the, the argument goes something like this. If, uh, if we were to acknowledge that the law of armed conflict, as IHL is also sometimes referred to, if we were to acknowledge that IHL applies to, to military cyber operations, that would encourage states to engage in such operations. And in other words, that would legitimize uh, cyber warfare and that would militarize uh, uh, cyberspace domain. So it's, it's, it's compelling, it's the, the moral sentiment that underlies it, it is understandable, but I would argue that if we put it under scrutiny, it doesn't hold water. So let's have a look at it in a little bit more detail. So my main answer, when we look at the question of militarization of cyber, of alleged militarization of cyberspace, the main answer is that we need to distinguish between regulation on the one hand and justification on the other. So in the first instance, at the first level, this is almost the philosophical point. 
If we acknowledge that law governs a certain type of conduct, what we are doing is not legitimating that conduct, we are simply regulating that conduct. So to give you a very clear example, if you finish listening to, this, to these talks today, you will walk outside of your house and you have a road there and you're deciding whether or not to cross it, you look at the lights and the light is red, you see that there is a clear rule that regulates whether or not you're allowed to cross the road. Now, to say that traffic rules govern our conduct when we are participants in traffic, to say that that somehow legitimates violating these rules wouldn't make much sense. If we acknowledge that uh, traffic rules govern our conduct, what we are saying is there are some rules that we as participants in traffic, whether as pedestrians, whether as cars, simply have to abide by. So what the law does is it contains the choice that we have, the choice in the conduct that we have to a certain set of this conduct, which is permissible by the law. So that's the philosophical point. But then moving on to the second point, IHL in its nature as a body of law is a restrictive body of law. And we know this because we have had international case law. So in the post Nuremberg trials, uh, it was held by uh, one, of these, uh, uh, one of these tribunals in the US and List case that IHL is prohibitive law. And we have also had a number of scholars who have taken that view that IHL is here to forbid, not to authorize manifestations of force. And in the third, you know, if you're still not convinced and if you're still hesitating, in the third instance, there is the important distinction of use ad bellum and use in bello, with which we have actually started this lecture. And in the use ad bellum, we have a clear general prohibition on the use of force, which is embodied in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter. So there is a prohibition for states to engage in conduct that amounts to the use of armed force. IHL only comes after that prohibition has been violated by one or more states. And IHL is there to regulate the armed conflict when, as a matter of fact, that armed conflict has started taking place. In other words, use in bello is agnostic on the legality or on the legitimacy of a particular armed conflict, which is a fact that the states have recognized when they agreed on the additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions, because this is reflected in the preamble to that treaty. So, in summary, on the first question, the ICRC view is, and it is also my personal view, that IHL is applicable to cyber operations during armed conflicts. So, in other words, what this means is that if states do use cyber capabilities during armed conflicts, then IHL constrains them in the choice of behavior that is available to them. Secondly, IHL protects civilians and civilian objects, but IHL does not legitimize cyber warfare nor does it militarize cyberspace. So that's the answer to the threshold question, which then brings us to many other, it could be a myriad questions that we, would, uh, that we could have a look at, but out of constraints for time, I'm going to look at two specific ones. So the question then becomes, with the threshold one out of the way, the question becomes, how do specific rules apply to cyber operations? And we're going to have a look at two, and we're going to start with, right now, with the weapons question. And so the weapon, weapons question concerns, or it could be extended to ask, how does the weapons review obligation apply to cyber capabilities? Now, we have said that IHL in principle is here for situations of armed conflict, but that doesn't mean that all of its rules only apply in situations of armed conflict. There are some rules of IHL that also apply in peacetime. Just a very clear example that everybody will be familiar with, when uh, Again, in a very domestic situation, you go outside and you see the emblem of the Red Cross or the Red Crescent, depending on which country you are in. That is the distinctive emblem, which is protected by the Geneva Conventions. So the international law bestows upon this emblem comes from IHL. But of course, states have to adopt legislation that protects this distinctive emblem already in times of peace. But the one that I want to focus on is a different one. I don't want to talk about the distinctive emblems. I want to talk about the one that you see at the very bottom of the slide, which is the duty to review the legality of new weapons, means, and methods of warfare. This is a duty that's embodied or enshrined in Article 30 of the first additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions. Now, the extent to which this rule applies to states differ differs on the basis of their uh, on. on, on on the basis of several considerations. So number one, for states who are states parties to the first additional protocol, the obligation is the most extensive 
And it obliges them to always determine whether the employment of a new weapon means or method of warfare that they are either studying, developing, acquiring, or adopting would be in some circumstances prohibited by international law. So that's a very extensive uh, obligation that applies to about 60, 170 states who have ratified the first additional protocol. Now, in the ICRC's view, the obligation to conduct legal review of new weapons also flows from the duty to ensure respect for IHL under Common Article 1. And Common Article 1 to the Geneva Conventions is binding on all states. So uh, in the ICRC's view, that's an obligation for all states. But even for states who are in the small group of states who haven't ratified the additional protocol and who disagree with this view, there are practical considerations which lead them to understand that these reviews are very important because simply speak, they need to ensure that the weapons that they use would in practice be used in compliance with existing law, including IHL, and so very pragmatically that then pr prevents the very costly consequences of approving and procuring some weapon, doesn't have to be a cyber weapon, just a weapon in general, which then would not be able to be used lawfully. So the, that's the weapons review obligation. Is a, It's a very important obligation under the law of armed conflict or under IHL. And if we can move to the next slide, let's have a look how it could apply to a hypothetical situation in time of, uh, or in relation to cyber capabilities. So let's now imagine, and this is not a pure hypothetical because we already have robots that can repair jet engines. So let's imagine that the state develops a new malware that is designed to cause physical damage to enemy military equipment by, mani by manipulating the maintenance process. So in other words, what this malware does, it spreads throughout the internet, throughout the networks to reach the target system in which it identifies what we call a PLC, a programmable logical component of that system. If it identifies the right PLC, it knows that it has reached the target system, it will change the way that this robotic maintenance software works. And so instead of the robot repairing a military equipment, it will slightly damage it, the equipment of the enemy cannot be used in practice. So that's a hypothetical. Let's use this hypothetical to understand how the weapons review obligation would apply in practice. So the first question and the very key question then becomes, is this actually a cyber weapon? And we run into the problems here because we don't have a generally accepted definition of what a cyber weapon is, but we could, as a, as a way of a possible argument, proceed as follows. Weapons are what are, are instruments that are being used in attacks. The notion of attack is defined by the law. We have the definition in Article 49 of the first additional protocol. So an attack is something that is an act of violence against the adversary. And we also know that the notion of violence, although it's controversial how far that notion extends, but we know that at the very minimum, it entails injury, death, damage, or destruction. So thus we can make the next logical step, and this has been done by authors of several of uh, manuals uh, on, on the at the international level, but also domestically, which is to define weapons as those instruments that are capable of causing such consequences, so that are capable of causing injury or death or damage or destruction. So if you follow that syllogism to its end, I would say that it, it follows logically, this argument could be seen as leading to the conclusion that such malware that causes physical damage, as in our example, we physically damage the, uh, the, the, the engine or the military equipment on the other side, could be interpreted to qualify as a weapon under IHL. So now, if we accept this argument that this could be qualified as a weapon, then in the next step, the question becomes, how do we assess this against the applicable uh, uh, rules of IHL? So the first question in the re legal review uh, process is always, does the weapon violate any express prohibition on its use? And now we can take this uh, step out of the way very easily because, as we have heard several times, we just simply don't have a, a general uh, treaty that would regulate the use of cyber, cyber capabilities. We have rules against the use of chemical, biological weapons or anti-personal landmines and other forms of military equipment, but we don't have a prohibition with their capabilities. So in the second step, we have to have a look whether the weapon violates any of the generally applicable rules. And there are two that are usually highlighted as the key ones in this regard. The first one is the prohibition of means of warfare that are of a nature to cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering. 
Now, this is likely inapplicable here because we are talking about an example, as we have said, that causes damage to objects, but that doesn't cause injury to persons. So we can take uh, that concrete uh, step out or that concrete uh, prohibition out of the way. Now, the second one uh, is more uh, important, and that's the prohibition of means of warfare that are by nature indiscriminate. So in other words, if this malware was designed in such a way that it would not distinguish between and military infrastructure, and it could cause damage to all without distinction, then it wouldn't pass this step because it would be by nature indiscriminate. So whether or not a new cyber capability passes this step will depend on the nature and on the extent of the effects that it has on the civilian infrastructure. So it is, in other words, theoretically possible that such a cyber capability could be employed in a way that would comply with international humanitarian law. But then you might ask, well, but what if it gets out of hand? And so the, uh, the, the man that we see on the picture on the left is not simply a meme of a, a, a guy uh, not being certain about what happens, but to people active in cybersecurity. Uh, this is someone who is very well known, uh, and uh, it's, he's called Mr. Marcus Hutchins, based in uh, Devon in England, which is very close to where I used to work at the University of Exeter. And he is very well known because he discovered a kill switch that stopped the, the spread of the WannaCry ransomware in 2017. So that's uh, the screenshot that you see on the right. It was something you really didn't want to see on your screen uh, back then. It's a ransomware that caused a lot of uh, disruption around the world, including to the NHS in the United Kingdom. But uh, what uh, the example of Marcus Hutchins and the WannaCry incident shows to us is the importance of, of being able to constrain or to control the cyber tool in time and in space. There are various tools that can be used to do that and thus to minimize the effect on, the, on, the, on civilian cyber infrastructure. But one of such tools is the kill switch. So uh, in other words, uh, a utility or a tool that can be used by uh, the operator to stop the spread of malware in real time, which is exactly what happened in the context of the WannaCry ransomware in 2017. So I'm going to uh, wrap up the discussion of the second question, which relates to the, the weapons or when can we consider cyber capabilities as qualifying as weapons? And then what are the constraints that IHL imposes on such capabilities? And let's have a look at the final question, which is the data question. And so in this part, I'm going to talk about how rules on targeting apply to cyber operations against data. Now, most of our listeners and actually viewers, because you need to see this image, if you look at the, 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 the image you see on the screen, you probably don't need to hesitate too long. You can distinguish between these two very easily. We see a, a group of children on the left, so civili clearly civilians who are protected by IHL. And then on the right-hand side, well, we don't know if these persons qualify as uh, someone who is directly participating in hostilities or as combatants, but to the extent that these persons take an active part in, in the hostilities, Hostilities, they would not be protected by IHL. So that's a very important distinction. And the way that the law formulates it, yeah, uh, is uh, uh, the following, and we see it in Article 48 of the first additional protocol, which says that uh, the parties to armed conflicts must at all times distinguish between when it comes to persons, on the one hand, civilian population, and on the other hand, combatants, and when it comes to objects, between civilian objects and military objectives. So in uh, the physical world, this doesn't pose, of course, there are discussions that uh, can be uh, had uh, around the nuances of these terms, but by and large, this doesn't pose too much too many problems, because when we look at an image like the one you see right now, which is a satellite image that uh, was used in the context of uh, a previous armed conflict, uh, we see the distinction between military revetments, so military barricades, which uh, in normal circumstances, due to their nature, would qualify as military objectives. And then a school, which again, in normal circumstances, when uh, it, it is uh, full of children or even when it is empty, it is a civilian object that is protected by the law. And the way that the law is this, uh, so how do we find out whether something, some specific thing in, a, in, in, in the physical space is protected by the law, is the following. and we 
you see this definition in Article 52, Paragraph 2 of the first additional protocol, which mandates that attacks shall, shall be limited strictly to military objectives. In other words, civilian objects must never be the object of attack. And then it continues by saying, insofar as objects are concerned, and this is a very important part, insofar as objects are concerned, military objectives are limited to those objects which make an effective contribution to military action and whose destruction or other forms of uh, disruption like capture or neutralization would offer a definite military advantage. But the key bit is the word objects, right? So in the definition, we see that in order to find out whether something is a military objective, it must first be an object, and then we look at whether it meets the criteria that are specified by Article 52 in great detail. So, so in the context of cyber operations, now let's imagine a further hypothetical to illustrate the problem of targeting of data. So this is Bob, let's call him Bob. Uh, and Bob works at a central registry office of one state that is unfortunately involved in an armed conflict against another state. And now Bob doesn't know it yet, but he is about to have a problem because even though his office where he works, the central registry office, is only maintaining civilian data, data on census taking, on social benefits, on voting, on taxation, even, even though this is the purpose of uh, his employer, the state with which his state is in a situation of an armed conflict decides to launch a cyber operation against this office. And so the operation is successful and what happens is that it destroys all the data that is held by the registry office. So the data is now deleted, but Bob actually doesn't know it yet, because when he looks around himself, the servers that uh, are surrounding him, the computers, the cables, even the screen of his own computer from which he is monitoring what's happening, might not show any, uh, any change, and there is certainly no physical damage to speak of. There is no smoke coming out of any of the equipment, there is no fire, and uh, the only effect is in cyberspace, is on these virtual things, and I'm intentionally using this uh, generic term because we are about to run into a problem, and these things are data. So the only effect is on data. Now, the question for you to think about is, does this actually amount to a violation of IHL? Now, there is no question that if state X decided to bomb the central registry office or to set it on fire or to otherwise attack it kinetically, that would be a violation of IHL and under most circumstances, a war crime. But is this also a violation of IHL when the effect is limited to cyberspace? Now, it turns out that uh, there are two main approaches and this is, as I said, it's an open question, which is the subject of controversy among scholars and among states. And that what it really comes down to is whether we define data as an object or whether we conceptualize this data as an object in the sense that IHL gives it. So the first approach is that IHL is not an object and thus it is not covered by the rules on targeting unless the operation in question somehow affects the tangible components of the cyber infrastructure. So yes, if the, if the computer stopped working, then even under this approach, the operation would still be subject to the rules of IHL and it could also only be uh, performed if it was targeted at a military objective. But we have said in our scenario that that's not the case. We have said that the only effect is on data itself in the central registry office. So then there is the second approach, which says that data is an object, and so if we accept that data is an object, then of course the operation against it, which results in its destruction, erasure or alteration, must comply with the requirements of IHL. So this is something that uh, has vexed uh, academics for quite some time, and uh, I have also had the pleasure of participating in that debate, but I'm going to try to summarize the views very obje as objectively as I can. So those who are in the no camp, who answer data is not an object, focus on the ordinary meaning of the term object. And they would say that data is not visible and tangible. It's not as visible and tangible as the computers that surrounded Bob in the previous picture, or maybe as the chair that he was sitting on. And thus, it is not something that 
at the time when the rules on targeting that are now enshrined in, Artic in Article 52.2 of the 1977 additional protocol, so it is not something that the drafters could have been thinking of in the 70s. Of course, the no camp has offers a fallback solution, which is that if cyber infrastructure is affected, so if these tangible things are somehow affected, then the cyber operation in question qualifies as an attack and thus it will fall within IHL. So this is not to say that the no camp removes all of the operations against data from the purview of IHL. No, but those operations that do not target, that do not affect the infrastructure itself, those would be outside of the remit of IHL, which is seen as a problem by proponents of the yes view, yeah, by those who, are, who answer the question, yes, data is an object. And they argue that if we interpret the term object found in the 1977 treaty, if we interpret it in an evolutive way, it actually falls within the ordinary meaning. Data actually falls within the ordinary meaning of objects in 2020. So just ask any teenager if when you wipe out their Instagram account, whether they see, the, whether they think that they have lost something of value, whether they, have, they think they have lost an object. So perhaps the notion of objects can also evolve over time. And then the proponents of the yes view also highlight that the notion of visibility and tangibility in the 70s, and then later on when it was used to comment on uh, the, the, the provision in the protocols, was meant to distinguish things that we can hold from goals and aims. So th that's what was meant when people said that things that are not visible or tangible are not to be seen as being within objects. But data, perhaps it cannot be seen, but it certainly can be destroyed and its destruction is certainly felt by those who are using the infrastructure as uh, not just problematic, but it can have destructive effects on our modern digitalized societies. Which also then brings me to the third point of those who say that data should be seen as an object, and that is the object and purpose. In other words, the teleology or the goal the, 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 that, that there is behind the provisions in question. And so, of course, we know that the additional protocol was uh, drafted in order to protect the victims of armed conflict and civilians are a big class of uh, victims of armed conflicts. And so if we have two interpretations, one of which is more protective to the civilians because their data held in a central registry office like the one where Bob works is protected. So if that's one interpretation and the other interpretation is that such uh, data would not be uh, protected. The proponents of the, the yes view say, well, it's the teleology, it's the object and purpose of the law that militates in favor of the extensive interpretation. So those of you who want to explore this further, there was a, a very interesting issue of the Israel Law Review in 2015, to which I had the chance to participate uh, together with uh, scholars, uh, including Heather Dinis and Mike Schmidt. And so we have described these views from an academic perspective, and you can explore it further there. But before I wrap up, let me just say a few words about what is the current ICRC position on this uh, question. And so the ICRC view is a bit of a compromise. It doesn't side with either of these two views, but, but we can probably say that it tends closer to the green uh, box on the previous slide, because what the ICRC's view is at the moment is that whether and to what extent civilian data constitutes civilian objects is unresolved as a question of law, so that, that's still unresolved. But to say that deleting or tampering with essential civilian data, such as the data that's held in the history office that we have just to say that that would not be prohibited would be difficult to reconcile again with the object and purpose of IHL and so and I find this very persuasive very convincing that the reporter files with digital files should not decrease the legal protection that is afforded by IHL in other words if we just take something that for now we have written on a piece of paper and stored in a file cabinet and now we transform it into data and until when it was in the paper cabinet, it was protected against being attacked. Now, suddenly when it's stored in a server, it would not be protected. I find that quite, quite problematic. And so I don't have a problem uh, uh, agreeing now that I have taken my academic hat off and joined the ICRC. I don't find the problem uh, identifying with this sort of compromise solution. But we can discuss that uh, during the Q&A. So let me just wrap up so that we have some time for questions at the end. Uh, and so what have we seen today? We started with three big questions, and I said that they are big in different ways. 
The first one, does IHL apply to cyber operations? I propose that we answer it in affirmative. To my mind, this is not a very difficult step, and the ICRC also has no doubt that that's the correct answer. IHL applies to cyber operations and thus it constrains what states are permitted to do in times of armed conflict. And when we do that, we can move on to the second and the third level, which are the specific questions how IHL applies. And so we have asked the weapons question, and I propose that here the answer should be that military cyber capabilities should be subjected to legal review. And we have seen how that could operate in practice on, with the example of the malware that was targeted at this robotic maintenance equipment. And then the, the third question that we asked was the data question with which we have actually just finished. And there I would propose that the answer is that wow, whichever specific nuance of the legal interpretation you take, but I would propose that the answer should be that the object and purpose of IHL support affording protection to civilian data. So I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for your attention. Heli, over to you. I look forward to hearing the questions that we might have received from the audience. Thank you so much, uh, Kupa. And uh, I think um, each time I'm listening to your lecture, I actually learn again. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it is really fascinating for non-lawyers how you explain so easily and understandably all these uh, difficult questions. Um, I think one of the questions that we have received is, um, is related with the current um, uh, ongoing um, international crisis. And, um, and there is a question whether the IHL would prohibit cyber operations against hospitals. So thank you, Heli, and thank you for your kind words. It's always a pleasure to participate in uh, events that you run. Uh, if, if not for anything else, then because you always give me beautiful compliments, and so I always enjoy our exchanges. But to answer your question, does IHL prohibit operations against hospitals? The answer is absolutely yes. There are some questions that we have covered today which are controversial, and we can debate about the extent of the protection that IHL gives to specific types of data. But when it comes to protection of hospitals, there is no doubt. Uh, there is no doubt that IHL protects them against any disruption, and that is because we have specific rules in the Geneva Conventions, and then also uh, enshrined in customary international law. So for those uh, who uh, want to explore this further, the ICRC has produced a study on customary international humanitarian law and rules that are specific to the protection of hospitals are rules 25, 28 and 29 of the study. And so if we put it all together, the, the rules from the Geneva Convention, those that we see in uh, uh, customary international law, they require that medical units personnel and transport must be protected by the parties to an armed conflict, must be respected and protected by the parties to armed conflict at all times. And so what does that mean, that they must be respected and protected? That entails two separate obligations. One is a negative obligation, which is very easy, that simply do not make these installations, these facilities, the subject of attack. And secondly, there is the positive obligation, which, is, which entails actually protecting them. So all feasible measures that are uh, available to states, to, to armed conflicts, to protect such facilities, such medical facilities from, uh, from interference. And so the only remaining step then is whether that protection, which is clear, it's black letter law, also extends to cyber operations. And so that takes us to the threshold question. So if we accept that IHL also limits cyber operations, which we have discussed, and I think that's the correct answer, then surely it also limits in the sense it prohibits cyber operations against hospitals. And as you rightly say, this is particularly important in against the backdrop of the current crisis. And it is also something that at the ICRC we have been saying for quite some time, so even before the, the current pandemic, we have looked at what are the potential human costs of cyber operations. And we have a longer report that we issued in May last year. And that I identified a particular vulnerability of the healthcare sector. So we already saw that there might be a problem there. And of course, as the, the current pandemic uh, began, we have seen cyber attacks against hospitals, which are particularly concerning. But when it comes to situations of armed conflict, there is no doubt that such facilities are protected from cyber attacks. 
Um, thank you. And the second question would be uh, related to uh, the core uh, subjects of IHL. Um, there is a question how and uh, when exactly the cyber operation can also constitute armed conflict. Uh, we see the belligerent behavior from states and reprisals in cyberspace. Uh, and at what point such activities can be considered armed conflict? So that's an excellent question, Heli, and uh, it's uh, one of those, the edges of which are controversial, but the core uh, we have an answer for already. So in other words, uh, we need to start answering it by looking at the types of conflict that we have in uh, international humanitarian law. There are two main types of conflict, international armed conflicts that are in essence conflicts between states and non-international armed conflicts that are in essence conflicts within one state. So usually between a state and, a, and an organized armed group or sometimes between several of such organized armed groups. So I see that we're running out of time. So let's, let me just answer the question, can a cyber operation start an international national armed conflict, where the intensity is particularly low. We know on the authority of the Tadic case of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, that an armed conflict, an international armed conflict takes place whenever there is a resort to armed force between states. And so I say that this question, the core of it is clear, because if a cyber operation produced effects that would be equivalent with a kinetic strike, so let's take an example of a cyber operation against the air traffic control uh, in another state, or a cyber operation that would open the floodgates of a dam and thus causing significant loss of life and uh, material destruction on the territory of another state, there is very little doubt that states would agree that this is to uh, an international armed conflict. And of course, luckily, no such incident has happened thus far. But where the edges of that question, as I have said, are a bit more controversial, is what happens when, there are, when the effects are not equivalent to such kinetic attacks. So, for example, when there is a cyber operation that disables the functionality of a power grid in the territory of another state, or that brings down the stock exchange. So the losses may also be extensive, but we don't see... Uh, specific effect in the physical world. And so on that, the law remains uncertain. And basically, you know, you said in the beginning, in your opening speech, that it's very important for states to come forward and to express their views on how international law applies. So this is one of the questions on which we need to hear more from states before we can say, okay, the law has settled in a certain way. Thank you, Kuba. And yes, uh, your uh, lecture confirms once again that um, the state practice and state uh, statements on artic and articulations on how a law applies are now uh, crucial for all of us. Thank you so much again. And, and this, your lecture now concludes the international security uh, part of our uh, virtual masterclass. And now we are going to discuss uh, capacity building issues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heli. Thank you.